Good morning and welcome to this month's SNOP Agility Webinar hosted by SteelWedge. Today we are delighted to welcome Laura Ciceri, Founder and CEO of Supply Chain Insights, who will cover today's webinar topic, Your SNOP Investment, The Time Is Now. Thank you for joining us. I'm Terry Bobier and I'll be your moderator for the next hour. We'll get started in just a few minutes, but before we do, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. This event is being recorded and will be emailed to you after the webinar to review or share with your colleagues. We encourage you to interact with our speakers, so feel free to post your questions at any time during the webinar in the question box within the side panel at the right of your screen. We'll do our best to address them in the Q&A at the end of the hour. With that, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Laura Ciceri, Founder and CEO of Supply Chain Insights. Laura continues to help supply chain professionals with thought-leading supply chain research. She has 35 years of diverse supply chain experience. This includes 12 years as an industry analyst, 15 years building supply chain software, and 12 years managing operation teams within, within manufacturing. Thanks to Laura for speaking. Let's go ahead and get started by passing the presentation over to Laura. Well, thank you so much. Uh, tough week in the market uh, with the devaluation of the Chinese currency and the work that's been happening in with the redefinition of trade in Europe. We have a lot of volatility in the market and I think it's a good time for us to sit back as supply chain leaders and think about what we do to sense and translate demand and to really help the organization to readjust the market dynamics. We do a study every year called the Supply Chains to Admire, and we find that the companies that do the best in adapting to supply chain trends actually have strong horizontal processes. And the horizontal processes are revenue management, sales and operations planning, corporate social responsibility, new product launch, and supplier development. And so the leaders talk about the development of T-shaped managers. So when you think about a T-shaped manager when we're in volatile times, they've got knowledge and they've got their feet in a function like distribution or manufacturing, but they are able to use their influence skills in these horizontal processes to help to translate demand, establish the right supply plan, and to continually adjust and orchestrate to the market. So with that, I'd like to share with you some research. As Terry talked in the next slide, you have you know, my background. And I would offer that if you have any questions following up from this webinar and you want to read any of the supporting research, I've written a couple books. The books are available on Amazon. I wrote a book called Bricks Matter at 30th anniversary of supply chain where I wanted to really celebrate the progress of supply chain leaders, but I found nine out of 10 companies were stuck at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turns. And then I wrote the book Metrics That Matter, which looks at how do we drive and improve financial balance sheets through horizontal processes, advanced analytics, and cross-functional teams. And so I would offer that some of these books are actually supporting materials for the research I'm going to share today. You can also find my writing on supplychainshaman.com and on SlideShare, but it gives you a little bit of perspective about me as a speaker. So with that, let's get on, Terry, with the uh, content today. You know, we really focus on helping the average Joe. You know, we find that there are a lot of people in the supply chain world that are struggling with how do they get data and research that is really impactful for the here and now, that's well-founded in research, not just somebody's opinion, and it's packaged with insights and recommendations to help the average Joe. So we're not just writing for the supply chain leader or for academia or for a consultant. We're writing for the guy or gal who have their feet on the ground who are trying to really work through supply chain problems. Next slide. And so as we think about, you know, what's happening and, you know, we publish the research openly and we're constantly publishing research. So take advantage of it. And these are the books I talked about. They're really there for reference materials. But as we think about it, next slide, Terry. 
and we think about this evolution, you know, for 32 years we've been on this supply chain journey. The first definition of supply chain as source, make, and deliver together was written about in 1982 and 1983. So while we might argue whether the 32nd anniversary is 2014 or 2015, what we do know is that companies are trying to get to a better performance at the intersection of inventory turns, operating margin, and customer service. The supply chain leader stands at this intersection. And we also know that it's harder to forecast demand than it was five years ago. If you measure forecastability, the ability to apply statistical methods to companies' item master or history, the forecastability of the forecast is worse than five years ago. And it's because we've thrown the, the supply chain out of balance with complexity. So when we look at the evolution of company performance at the intersection of inventory turns and operating margin, we find that only 10% of companies are making improvement here. And we also find that one of the characteristics of companies that are making improvement here are the companies that have the strong horizontal processes. And the one that we're going to talk about today is sales and operations planning. And sales and operations planning is really key to driving alignment, which builds dynamic capabilities in the organization. The biggest gap we'll see is between the sales teams and the operations teams, and also improving agility. And we define agility as the ability to have the same cost, quality, and customer service given a level of demand volatility. And when we're aligned and when we're agile, we're able to not only drive growth, which the average growth increase for a mature sales and operations planning team is at least 2%, but we're also able to drive our performance up this picture towards the best scenario. Next slide. So when we look at company performance, we find that the supply chain is a complex system with complex processes with increasing complexity. So you might say, well, what does that mean for you? Well, what it means is that these nonlinear relationships between the metrics of inventory turns and cost and complexity, things like changing customer segmentation or changing item masters, have a nonlinear relationship in a complex system that can't be modeled in an Excel spreadsheet. 93% of companies will be using Excel spreadsheets either to augment software or in placing software systems. And so one of the first steps you've got to think about is how do you find a supply chain software partner that allows you to model this complex system that's very dynamic with complex processes and increasing complexity. And at the core, you must be able to model a feasible plan. And a feasible plan represents your supply constraints, your supply bottlenecks. Those are both asset-based to manufacturing or material-based and allows you to look at what is the potential of the supply chain and how do you have what-if analysis to be able to model not only under what you think will happen but what might happen. And we find that only one-third of companies have the ability to model what might happen and what if capabilities. Because when many companies put in advanced planning systems, they didn't think about the need for what if modeling around a feasible plan on this complex system. Next slide. And so when we model this complex system and we're working on how do we have the best outcomes in SNOP, we need to model growth scenarios. So Perhaps sales or marketing say that they're going to grow X percent and we need to determine the profitability, the dependent inventory positions and be able to balance against complexity which might look at maybe outsourced contract manufacturing or bringing in distribution centers. But we also need to know what happens if that growth doesn't happen. What happens if, you know, perhaps we've underestimated it and the growth is more than we expect. And so the ability to model the potential of these nonlinear relationships on this effective frontier is really key to a strong sales and operations planning technology. 
And as you think about the metrics and you think about the modeling to be able to look at the trade-offs here, we need to think about the visualization to the balance sheet. When I find that companies do the best in sales and operations planning, they have an executive meeting that really focuses on not just the what, but the so what as it ties to the balance sheet and not just maybe a best case, but also some potential conditions that might happen. And so they're constantly modeling and refining the plan. The plans are monthly and they may have weekly updates for execution, but the weekly updates really look at the execution of that monthly plan. And it's important that we plan and that we not confuse the urgent with the important. It takes time to plan, but it's well worth it. Next slide. So, you know, as we think about the typical organization, the organization isn't aligned. And the sales and operations planning processes helps to improve alignment. So we often will have the chief marketing officer who's looking at growth, we'll have sales that's incented for volume, and we'll have the back office or the operations teams that are incented for cost. Now, a lot of times people say, well, where within the organization should the SNOP team report? And so we're going to have some fun today. We're going to ask you to fill out a polling question. So Olivia, if you can pull, pull up our poll. Because one of the issues is people will often say, you know, who should have the reporting relationship? Should it be the CFO? Should it be the COO? Should it be the CEO? Should it be the profit center manager? Should it be sales? Should it be marketing? Should it be manufacturing? And this is one of the first questions that we get. What I tell people to do is to map the profit center managers in their organization and consider those to be the reporting relationships. We would never want to have the SNOP process report to sales or report to marketing because that's where you get your highest bias and error. The second highest bias and error is when it reports to manufacturing. So select one here and let's see what the response is. And Olivia, when you get a minute, push us the response and we'll talk about it so that we can see you know, just where people think it should report. So the COO or the CEO, I like that. We often find that when it reports to the CFO or the chief financial officer that we end up with a problem in change management about the role of the budget. And in fact, I've sometimes seen SNOP teams kick their CFO off the SNOP team because the CFO may want to constrain the operating plan with budget targets. And the operating plan needs to be really in sync with the market. And the budget cannot, by definition, be in sync with the market. And so as a result, the SNOP should be an input into budget updates, but the budget should never constrain the SNOP plan. And there's sometimes tension there. So it's good to have a report to the COO or the CEO or in the case of a very large company like uh, five billion and above where we have multiple profit center managers that maybe represent certain brands. If it is a P&L owner, that's where the SNOP process should report. However, don't assume just because that's the right reporting structure that people know how to manage an SNOP process. It requires training and the devils in the details. Thank you very much, Olivia. And now, Terry, if we can move on to my next slide. So we need to assume that when we're working on sales and operations planning, by definition, the organization is not aligned. And what do I mean by that? Well, I talked about that the incentives are not aligned in the prior slide, but here what you see is when we ask companies to rate how important is it for functions to be aligned, and then we look at the gap between functions, sales and operations is consistently the largest gap. And interestingly, if we move on to the next slide, when we look at other functions, the finance team is a different view. They see that the organization is pretty closely aligned. You don't see the gap. And so the people from the finance team come to the SNOP team and they're like, why can't you guys just not get along? They don't understand that there are structural issues around 
how we reward organizations and the understanding of the sales process by operations and of the operations process by sales that have to be really overcome to drive alignment. But finance, when they pull up their seat to the table, they don't understand that. Their view of the world is that the alignment is much tighter. And when we look at the next slide, which is the IT perspective, the IT group doesn't think there's any issues with alignment, right? They're really more worried about sales and IT, but they don't understand why these business teams can't just get along on SNOP. And so I want to talk about that challenge of how do we drive alignment and agility to really be able to harness the opportunity to improve operating margin, improve inventory, and grow the top line. Next slide. So as we think about this, you know, the horizontal processes are integration with product development, revenue management, network design, when we have network design that's happening monthly connected to sales and operations planning, we drive alignment faster. When we have integration with product development, network design, and sales and operations planning, where we're designing new product launch in the middle stage gates, we are able to drive alignment. When we have the connection of corporate social responsibility to supplier development, we're able to drive alignment. And when we're able to model the what-if scenarios for risk management, we also drive alignment. So when we think about these horizontal processes, we have to think about them as the planks that cross over the functions. And as we come together to work on these cross-functional processes, we use them to really align and to come up with a common plan based upon the best scenario. So it's real important that we can model what if conditions, that we have the ability to have a feasible plan, that we have visualization that makes sense. The traditional advanced planning systems have visualization, but it's really for the planners. You know, most of the sales guys or the executive teams would look at the traditional APS screens and they would yawn. And so the effective executive meeting is about an hour meeting with strong visualization and what if conditions. You're not taking them through the detailed plans that are really the steps before that. Next slide. Okay, so we've talked about alignment, we've talked about agility. You know, SNOP is not a new process. It has also been around by about 35 years. And, you know, back in the 1980s, we used to do SNOP. And, you know, the problems haven't gotten any easier, even though the technology's gotten a lot better. The organizations have gotten more complex. You know, we've had 2,700 mergers and acquisitions in the process industries alone in the last decade. So the organizations are bigger. We're dealing with more global organizations, but it's a very tough nut to crack. Now, one of the things that has changed is that companies just don't have one SNOP process. In fact, they have four on average. And so these multiple SNOP processes may have different needs for modeling supply. They may be at different maturity levels. But all of the SNOP teams are struggling with a lack of skilled resources. And in fact, skilled resources are one of the number one problems that people have because they are not training resources internally. You know, most of the supply chain skills are coming out of the North American and European universities, and where we really need skill development is in the emerging economies. And we've had so much turnover in the last decade with people retiring, moving on, mergers and acquisitions, that you know, building skilled resources is really essential because even though people may have done SNOP at another company with another job, this one can be defined slightly different, and so it's important to be able to have the training. The other thing is people struggle, and the number one issue that people have is lack of support from the executive team. Now, I mentioned that the CFO doesn't see the gaps that the supply chain leader is feeling, and so the more we can train them on the what-if conditions and we can help to visualize the sales and operations planning, the better it is. And, you know, one of the things I advise people to do is don't go into an SNOP meeting and talk acronyms and what I call the supply chain wonk, wonk, wonk talk. 
you know, this is not about talking supply chain buzzwords. This is about business. And so the more we're able to translate the outcomes and the decisions into business value statements, the more we can get the support of the executive team. But if we're talking about skew item XYZ at uh, mean absolute percent error 30 days with this kind of constraint, they'll actually roll their eyes back on their heads. So this needs to be a business meeting. The other issue, which is a very large issue, is the ability to get to data. And I was having some interviews with some supply chain leaders the other day that talked about the fundamental need to train people where data is. You know, many times we've implemented systems or we've done upgrades and we change the context of data or the source of data and we don't train people how to get to data. And so as we think about how tough this nut is to crack, We've really got to think about these top five challenges and we've got to think about how do we go about really dealing with the people side of SNOP. Many times people will talk about, you know, it's people and process and technology, right? I come to the table and say that, you know, about 60% of this is change management people getting really clear on data governance and global governance of who makes what decisions, you know, corporate decisions, business decisions, regional decisions. It's about 30% process and about 10% technology. You can't get there without technology, but you've really got to tackle the change management issues head on. You've got to get the executive teams aligned. You've got to teach people where the data is. You've got to be able to talk the language of business. You've got to train your skilled resources. So, you know, as you think about, you know, how you make this more effective, don't think about it as a destination. Think about it as a journey. The best SNOP teams that I talk to have been at it for years. They probably reached what I would call my stage four or stage five maturity a couple years ago, but they keep continuing. They have excitement to continue. The worst case is where the SNOP process is seen as a meeting, right? People hate the meeting. They talk about how do I get people to come to the meeting. If that's your situation, you got to really rethink how do you make this an engaging process that really drives the business, that people want to come to, that's not a drudgery meeting with spreadsheets and lots of handouts, but something that's visual and really talks about the essence of the business. Next slide. And so that's why it's a tough nut to crack. We're not necessarily aligned. Uh, we don't have what-if capabilities. It's very important to agility. Um, sometimes people run into problems because it's aligned by product and they can't necessarily model the commercial side of the business. Um, but it needs to be run monthly and it needs to be tied to execution. Next slide. So when we think about SNOP and we think about where it needs to report, I talked about that the P&L owner is the best place for it to report. But when we ask planners, you know, about the leadership understanding of planning, we find that direct supervisors have a higher level of understanding of planning than the P&L owner. Often the business wants to focus on the here and now and the reactive not necessarily focused on the long-term planning and so as we work on sales and operations planning processes we've got to train the P&L owner about the basics of planning and help them with what does what if analysis mean and what kind of constraints do we have and what are some of the options and be able to position that in the language of the business. So this is one of the ways that we get through the alignment issues is by education and helping people to see the options through visualization. Next slide. So the other issue is balance. The best supply chain SNOP processes have balance. They're balanced between what I call the big S, and that's not Superman, but the big S, the sales teams, the commercial teams, and the OP teams. And you can see that only about, you know, 20% are in balance, and most companies are out of balance. So one of the health checks for you to drive alignment is to ask yourself, do you have balance between the S and the OP in the SNOP process? 
the characteristics of this would be that you address the concerns and the problem statements that are in both sides of this equation and that both groups feel that they're heard. If the plan is only focused on commercial or only focused on operations, you're not really doing an SNOP process. So focus on balance. And, you know, if you're questioning if you're in balance, we actually have these surveys online in our new community and you can contact us and we'll help you and you can test your own organization. Next slide. So we've, it improves alignment. Most companies aren't balanced. And the way we balance is we want to balance the market drivers. So we don't want to ask sales what they're selling because, you know, the highest bias and error happens when sales forecast. We want to actually look at the market drivers. You know, maybe it's a new account. Maybe it's uh, competitive information. We want to ask sales market drivers. We want to understand competition. And we want to balance those go-to-market strategies with demand orchestration. So asking ourselves about what if around inventory form and function. It isn't just sufficient to have a focus on inventory levels. What we've got to do is ask ourselves, what form should the inventory be? Should it be in a raw material or semi-finished good or a finished good? And what is the function and how does the function of inventory change? And what does that mean for obsolescence or slow moving and potential write-offs? And that gets to the function of inventory, safety stock and transit stock, cycle stock, seasonal stocks. And what assumptions are we making in the building of inventory? You know, in the supply chain, we have two buffers. We have manufacturing and we have inventory. And, you know, in, historically, manufacturing played a larger role as a buffer. But with the outsourcing of manufacturing and the fact that many times people, if they have manufacturing, it's heavily utilized, manufacturing is less of a buffer and inventory is our primary buffer of variability. And then network strategies. I talked about that the more mature SNOP processes are bringing network strategies and actually working on the design of the supply chain monthly. Now, I'm not talking about bricks and mortar because, you know, we can only make those decisions occasionally, but I'm talking about flows. I'm talking about push-pull decoupling points, postponement strategies, uh, whether to change modes of uh, shipment or change alternate bills of material or bring on additional suppliers. The things that we can do around the rhythms and flows of the supply chain and also to look at commodity strategies and what that means to aggregate buying. So when we're able to get these two to come together, we have balance. And this is a good checklist for you and your own audit to say, am I balanced? Because if you're balanced and if you're aligned, you have a higher probability of driving the market performance of greater revenue, a balance between operating margin and inventory turns. And when that happens, based upon the research we've been doing with Arizona State University, you can drive higher market capitalization. And for more on those relationships, I would take you to some of the research that we've written. Next slide. So the value proposition for sales and operations planning is strong. But we can't not just think about what does the S mean, what does the AND mean, and what does the OP mean. In fact, one of the mistakes I find is that people skip over the AND, and the AND is where we have most of the problems. So let's just go through this chart. You know, some people think that S is ask sales, but I see S as let's focus on our market drivers. How do we shape demand? How do we really increase the baseline lift? And what is effective in driving demand? Now, many people think that the and is, you know, the integration of forecasting or demand or sales input to supply, and that's too simplistic. Instead, I think the and is about mixed translation. One of the things that Steel Wedge does really well is mixed translation and attachment rate planning and discrete manufacturing, which allows us to really configure and do what-if analysis of configuration. But it's also about the design of that value network to optimize the trade-offs, minimize the risks, balance cycles, and orchestrate demand. So we're looking at not demand as a number, but we're looking at ranges and we're looking at potential changes in demand and what could happen and what that impact is on mix in the supply chain. 
And the manufacturing plan isn't just OP. Instead, it's the trade-offs between source, make, and deliver because companies that are able to drive higher levels of inventory turns and operating margin actually orchestrate across make, source, and deliver together. So I'll tell you a story. I benchmarked 90 uh, supply chains, and I had an argument with the person I was benchmarking with that I would find that the company that had the best procurement cost, the best manufacturing cost, and the best logistics cost would have the best total cost. I never found that situation. In fact, what I found was that the companies that had the best functional cost, in other words, the best manufacturing cost, would actually be much worse on total cost. And the reason is that sometimes we can optimize a single function and we sub-optimize the rest. So as we think about building the potential of the supply chain, we've got to focus on total cost and the trade-offs between source, make, and deliver and the inventory strategies for that. Okay, that's a lot of a lot to think about, and it really requires maturity and evolution for some companies against more traditional foundational thinking. Next slide. So let's get to letter perfect. Let's drive alignment. Let's drive balance. Let's increase growth. Let's increase the potential of the supply chain to raise operating margin and inventory turns. You know, I talked about one of our big barriers is getting to the right data in a timely fashion. You know, take that through the cycle. Teach people where the data is. Help people with extracts. Bring uh, real-time information in cloud-based analytics. And really help people to get at data. Don't just assume they're going to know where to get it. And then this lack of understanding by the executive team, I think when we translate it into balance sheet numbers and we translate it into things they care about, they get more serious. And the lack of skilled resources, it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. So you've got to train your own resources and you've got to be able to work on continually raising the bar because the salaries for planners are increasing and one of the biggest gaps is the ability to source SNOP planners today, and we've done a lot of research in this area. So you're going to have a lot of turnover, and it's going to get to be worse, not better. And so you know, you've got to train and you've got to plan for turnover. And these are three really critical issues to hit. All right, let's talk about the challenges. We've talked about alignment. We've talked about the so what, who cares. Let's go to the next slide. And as, as we think about this, we've got to think about the change management. Remember I talked about 60% of this is change management. So as you move through maturity, one of the first real nuts you've got to crack is what is the role of the budget, right? And you've got to deal with this head-on with finance and that the budget should never constrain SNOP. And then we've got to move from just a volumetric view of matching demand and supply on a volumetric level to really being able to analyze for profitability. You know, and I talked about that a big barrier is getting to data and also a big barrier is understanding how people actually attribute cost. And so this will take you some time, but it's really one of the areas where the finance group can help and I find companies will mature fastest if they have a supply chain finance team overlaying the SNOP process. Then pick the technology solutions that enable the visualization and what if capabilities that your culture demands. Don't assume that those are there. Look for it in RFP and ask for the vendors to demo it and make sure that you have scenarios that are demoed that represent what you need to have in your system for visualization and what if. Now the last one is even harder. It's moving from an inside out process to an outside in process. So what do I mean by that? Most supply chains are out of sync with the market. And the reason is that they plan based upon orders and shipments. And an order is not a true representation of demand. In fact, an order represents what is consumed with what's called demand latency. So the time to translate the demand from consumption to an order varies, and that time is called demand latency. And it can vary from two days to 90 days. So something like allergen drugs will have a demand latency of about 60 to 70 days. 
So the orders represent what happened in the market 60 to 70 days. Something like Tide detergent will have a demand latency of 7 to 14 days. Something like medical devices may have a demand latency of six months. So it's based upon what is the velocity of happening in the channel and how long does it take to trigger replenishment. So when you move from inside out to outside in, you move from a view of planning on orders and shipments to really looking on market demand and market consumption and using channel usage and channel sales and looking at the movement through distributors, the movement through the warehouses, and the ability to really model the channel. And those more mature processes that are demand-driven and market-driven, they're outside in. And they're looking at how do I match the enterprise flows to the channel, and how do I match the enterprise flows to suppliers, and how do I align the rhythms and cycles from the customer's customer to supplier's supplier. The movement to outside-in processes is very suitable for cloud-based deployments and allows you to really work with key customers and suppliers to be able to drive these outside-in views. So this is my work on maturity and some of the change management issues. Hit these head-on in training and make sure that you pick the technologies that fit with your culture. Next slide. So we talked about some of the challenges, some of the barriers. When we move from inside out to outside in, we may have to redeploy the technologies because we're dealing with different flows and we're setting up the technologies to be able to work on channel demand or supplier demand. And so as we go through this maturity curve where we are developing a feasible plan and that has to be the foundation to really being able to match demand with supply, to model profitability, and then we get that great inside out view, we've got to move to the outside in view to really be able to manage market volatility and do what if analysis that aren't just supply chain but also value networks to align our value networks. Because we've never had a more volatile market with a greater market need to be able to manage value networks. Next slide. So barriers, evolution, again I talked about the fit of the technologies. Every culture has a different definition of a planner. We have those planners that are very central around base level modeling. So they're the guys that are doing the network design, the inventory flows, the constraint based modeling, and we have our core demand modelers. But then we have casual and business modelers, and the casual and business modelers may only want to see a part of the business, or maybe they want to have a managerial override, or perhaps they want to see the execution to plan. And so we need role based views for individuals across the company so that we can design the visualization for the need. We also need technologies that allow us to move from a volumetric response to a profitable plan, and we need the ability to run what-if analysis. Now you can see that one of the barriers in the market is we don't have the technologies that we would like. And often the technology fit require multiple technologies because we've got to go across roles and we've got to redefine some of the technologies to be able to get the flexibility that we need in SNOP. So with that, we've talked about the barriers, where we are on technologies. Let's take our next polling question, Olivia, if we can. If we can move the polling question. So let's talk about value. You know, I talked about that mature companies get an average of 2% growth. They're able to power up my best scenario for inventory turns, operating margin, and customer service. On a scale 1 to 5, how much value do you see in SNOP with 5 being the most value and 1 being no value? Let's uh, see what we get there. 5 being the best value and 1 being no value. Let's see what people are experiencing in their organization today. I'm hoping that there's a lot. Okay, so, you know, we have more on the positive side than we do on the negative, so that's goodness. Um, 
you know, I would love to do a follow-up slide to find out what your barriers are, but I do have a survey in the field if you want to participate in the survey that would allow you to see where your organization is. And again, we work on open content research, so a lot of the research I'm sharing with you today is available on SlideShare or on our website, and you're welcome to use the data. Thank you for sharing in our poll. Now let's go back to the slides. And if you have any questions that you would like to put in the chat window to have a dialogue, I would love to address your questions as well as I go through. So we talked about that when we pick the technologies, we've got to think about all the planners in the organization. And this has actually been good learning for me as an analyst. You know, in the 1990s, planning teams were a lot smaller. You probably had five to ten people in most organizations, but now I work with companies that have hundreds and even thousands of planners. So as we think about the use of the technology, we've got to think about not only those core planners, but the business planners and the casual users. And the casual users are often business guys that may or may not know much about supply chain. So when we get out into the casual users, we've got to have visualization that is not so enamored with supply chain kind of lingo that they don't want to go to it and it has to have high usability. So we've got to have systems that go across this continuum. Next slide. So alignment, balance, technology gaps, process gaps. Again, you know, the process gaps follow a lot about what we've talked about in technology. It's the ability to orchestrate cross-functionally to manage opportunities and risk. And this really requires what-if analysis and cost data. Only 12% of companies today can get to total cost data. And we need to be able to use the technologies to determine the profitable plan. And that requires us to be able to do financial modeling. And the technologies have come a long way in the ability to collaborate in between people and to really be able to you know, drive process flows. But think about these process gaps as you look at technologies and how the technologies can help you. Next slide. Now, when we ask people about technology effectiveness, this is from a study of 450 planners, and we did a box and whisker representation. I want to tell you how they read this slide. So the long black line tells you the range of answers. We were asking people about how effective their systems were on a scale of 1 to 7, with 7 being the most effective, and the area in the blue circle is the average. So you can see that the variability in demand planning is a lot higher than supply planning, and the satisfaction in this sample, which were some of the largest Fortune 1000 companies, was higher in supply than demand. We find that this is often the case, and demand is not very well understood. Most of our systems are put together with a more supply-centric view. You can also see that the range of responses on inventory is also pretty wide, and the understanding of how people move from form and function to push-pull decoupling points and really manage inventory is often a struggle within organizations, and one of the watchouts is when you buy inventory technologies, you also have to designate a role for inventory planning to be able to do this work to design the buffers. Now you can see the SNOP processes do not have the range of demand or inventory, but you know you do have a bigger range than supply. So we still have a lot of issues in the market around SNOP technologies that I talked about which were what-if analysis and profitability modeling. Next slide. And unfortunately, many people will augment that with the ability to use spreadsheets. Now, I also talked about the best processes will include network modeling and design. And these are the tools to basically model and optimize the supply chain network. I'm not talking about bricks and mortar. I'm talking about flows. And when we do this, we're able to really augment some of the what-if conditions in the SNOP process through advanced modeling. Next slide. And so thinking about this, we go through evolutions where, you know, the first couple of stages are all about bricks and mortar or all about logistics, but that's not really where I'm focused here on the SNOP integration. Instead, I'm looking at network focused, and I'm looking at network flows, and I'm looking at 
what should the network look like based upon the scenario that I'm actually modeling? And so the SNOP teams, the core modelers, are working with network design specialists to be able to look at, you know, what should the flows be and what should it look like? And, you know, they're doing this either quarterly or monthly to be able to refine the supply network. Next slide. So, you know, it brings us to the end. You know, I think SNOP is one of the most important things to invest in today. With higher market volatility and with slowing growth, it is a way to drive and beat the market. However, it requires alignment that does not exist in the normal organization. The alignment has got to be built, and it's got to be built through an understanding of how this horizontal process called SNOP can actually drive business results. It requires helping people to get to data and working on balance in the systems and really buying the right technology so we can have role-based usability and what-if analysis and model profitability. So those are my thoughts. Any questions? Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Laura. We did have a number of questions that came in advance of the webinar as well as during the webinar today. We'll use the rest of the hour to try, try to address as many of those as we can. So the first question is, how do you motivate stakeholders for SNOP? Well, I think you motivate them by results. I, you know, I think what you want to do is help them with their current orbit chart results uh, like I showed and uh, where they are at in maturity on the supply chain effective frontier and you really ask the question about, you know, would you like to have better growth and better inventory margins and better operating uh, margins and inventory levels and you go from there. Thanks, Laura. The second question is what key performance indicators for SNOP must be discussed and agreed to within a manufacturing operations company? Yeah, I think one of the things you want to agree to is that you're going to give people time to plan. You know, often I'll find people will buy technology, but, you know, they won't give people time to plan. And one of the frustrations of planners is they stay in meetings a lot and they don't get time to plan. So, you know, you need to be sure that the planners' roles and the job descriptions and the workload allow them time to plan. That's number one. Number two, we can't make this a meeting. We have to make this an important process. And we've got to really be able to serve the organization. And so in that process, you know, one of the things to ask yourself is, do people want to come to the SNOP meeting? If they don't want to come and you've got a big stick after them trying to force them into a meeting, it's probably a good time to step back and say, have we designed this system to really serve the organization? The third is, do you have balance in the SNOP? And I talked about what that is. And, you know, do you have alignment? Do you have clarity on strategy and goals? You know, when I ask people about SNOP maturity, I ask them a couple of simple questions. And, you know, many people can't answer them, but they're a good starting point. What's your goal? In other words, why are you doing SNOP? And very clear value statement. And if you've got that clear value statement, people can rally around it. They can get on board. Number two, how do you drive the balance in alignment? How do you judge your success? What do you measure? And I like to say, you know, focus on five key measurements. And sometimes people measure way too many things. I've been to SNOP meetings where they hand me a big deck and I say, how do you ever get through this deck? And they laugh and say, we can't. People can't manage more than five to seven metrics. And so I say measure growth, year over year revenue or in market share. And market share is real important because you want to not only be growing but really getting that market share. Measure inventory turns, uh, not cash to cash because cash to cash is a compound metric and, you know, we've improved cycle times but we've not necessarily improved inventory. Third, measure customer service. Uh, really focus on on time and in full and look at those separately. Five, you know, forecast accuracy I think still matters. Work on continuous improvement and forecast accuracy. Really focus on forecast value add and how you do that. And then fifth, cost. And don't put cost first. You know, 
You'll get more momentum from sales and the P&L leader if this is marketed as growth, profitable growth, than you know, a cost reduction exercise. And you've got to balance those metrics holistically to really be able to drive alignment. Does that help? Yeah, thank you, Laura. The next question is, how do you engage collaborative forecasting in this methodology? So collaborative forecasting, which takes sales input, really has to have uh, managerial overrides to be sure that we're improving the forecast. And we have to use forecast value add to be able to determine by taking sales input, are we improving the forecast or not? So we recently did some benchmark data with 10 very large companies, some of the most mature planning companies in the world, and we noticed that the forecast is more accurate at the third lag, in other words, 90 days out than 30 days out. And we asked companies about why, and what we found is that sometimes people had used collaborative forecasting with sales the wrong way. They had just taken sales input without validating the input or really looking for, is the sales input making the forecasting process better? And the way to do that is through forecast value add to compare what's happening in the forecast process to the naive forecast, which would be if we weren't doing any of this, if we were just using last month's shipments, will we be better or worse? And so having that discipline is really important for collaborative forecasting. I hope that helps. Yes, it does. The next question is, in many companies, Finax acts as the gatekeeper to align plan with budget targets. How would you address the change management required to make finance a contributor rather than a detractor of the SNOP process? Well, I would start with some training. I would help them with, uh, you know, why the budget as a constraint is a bad thing and show them through network design simulation that, you know, things it's like constraining inventory in a growth period is a bad thing because it will affect customer service. Or that by falsely aligning uh, targets that aren't in line with market potential is a bad thing because we have a sledding effect of the metrics. So I'm dealing with a couple of companies right now that, you know, tell me that bad news travels slowly in organization, good news travels fast, and so when the market slows, like the market's slowing now, what will happen is people will put their foot on the accelerator for sales and marketing programs and they'll go into a denial phase that the market is slowing down and it'll take six to eight months for some organizations to get through the denial to really align those processes. And when the finance leaders can see market data, they can see channel data, and they can see the actual visibility of channel data, then it becomes a different conversation. And when they see the what-if analysis against channel data and the impact on the business, then I think you can drive more alignment to help the finance people to actually be an advocate. So I think it comes from visualization, what-if modeling, and the impact on the metrics that matter. Lastly, what are the most common barriers and high-risk constraints that supply chain leaders are challenged with as they are developing an SNOP process that best fits their business? Well, I talked about the challenges, and there are many, but you know, my advice would be make this a business process, make this about the business and improving the business, make it timely and disciplined, give your planners time to plan, report the business results, market the results. I find companies that are able to drive the most maturity actually market the results and they'll track the results of the plans. Don't assume that people automatically know, you know the benefits. And work on building organizational talent over time. And it takes investment, it takes stewardship and really strong influence management and talk the language of business and have fun doing it. There's nothing better than, I think, being a business leader in SNOP. So thank you so much, Laura. We have about one or two minutes left today. Would you like to add any last comments? No, I just, if people have any questions, reach out, and all of the slides are available uh, through open content sharing. Thank you for having me today, and I look forward to hearing from people as they go on their SNOP journey.
Okay. Thank you. A big thank you again to Laura Ciceri. As I mentioned on the top of the call, we'll be sending out a recording in the next couple days. So look for that in your inbox and be sure to share it with your colleagues. We hope you have enjoyed this session and will continue to join our monthly SNOP Agility webinar series. Have a great day.